There are two people connected with KPFA's history that seem to stand out and to be discussed more often than, than anyone else. One of them, of course, being Lou Hill, who founded the station. And uh, there is, at this point in time, more or less unanimous agreement that he was a great man and uh, uh, a patron saint uh, and uh, somebody who set the, uh, the lines of the station at the very beginning, and that even if those have been departed from, and there's argument about how much they have been departed from and how much they should or should not have been departed from, but nevertheless, there he stands as a sort of, of uh, Thomas Jefferson of, of, uh, of, of Pacifica Radio, and, and everybody admires him. There's another person uh, whose position with the station is somewhat more equivocal. Elsa Knight Thompson, the public affairs director from uh, the, uh, I think, about the late 50s, the middle 50s, on up into, uh, uh, the, into the 70s. Uh, there's much less agreement about her malevolence or benevolence in relation to the station. Although it's probably fair to say that now that she is safely dead and buried, that she has, on the whole, joined the Pantheon. And if, uh, uh, if KPFA were accustomed to setting up niches with saints in them, uh, you would find at the portals of KPFA Lou Hill on one side of the door and Elsa Knight Thompson on the other side of the door and a Gothic arch spanning the space in between them. But when she was around, particularly towards the end, she was subjected to a line of criticism uh, which went from the considered to the hysterical, which described her as a person of lofty judgment, of uh, great intelligence, but also of great arrogance, and uh, somebody who, if you, uh, if you did not measure up to her very high standards, you were likely to find yourself eaten for breakfast. And she was somebody who maintained an, an iron grip on the public affairs programming, and it was not just a question of its content, because one of the things that she believed in was that its content should be as wide as possible and the, the divergence of opinion should be as wide as possible. But also on things like production standards, she was very concerned that the station sound professional. She had come from the professionality of the BBC. She was an experienced broadcaster. But nevertheless, she was accused of this arrogance and... and uh, uh, distance and uh, aristocratic aloofness, all of these qualities were, during his lifetime, used to describe Lou Hill. He was subject to the same kind of criticisms from those who found him unsympathetic. Every one of those, I was careful to use not a single word in relation to Elsa that I have not heard used by someone or other in relation to Lou Hill. But it was all right because he was a man. This was at a time when America was such a totally male-dominated society that this was not thought about. Elsa herself was virtually a man in crossover dress because she had had the experience down through the years of knowing that only men gained the position of authority and, the, and of responsibility and were taken seriously. And so more and more she behaved and talked like a man, that is a person whose authority was unassailable and you better listen, I know what I'm talking about. And she got away with it. But there were limits, of course. She could go only so far and no further. What was never open to her was the possibility of becoming the station manager. That was out of the question. And I think that the story of the end of Elsa's life is a story of gradually accumulating 
bitterness over the fact that the logical direction of her line, of the line of her career, could not be achieved because it was not a permissible thing. And she became, she could not become the station manager, therefore, to a certain extent, she became a witch. Uh, she was a Cassandra that was almost always right, but never believed. And at the end, I think she, she descended into a kind of bitterness, which had all kinds of explanations for it. If she had been able to move into the position that logically she should have moved into, all of, of well, uh, many of her hang-ups would have just disappeared. She would have been there. She wouldn't have not had to be defensive. She wouldn't have had to have been offensive. She would have been at that pinnacle that she deserved. But not being there turned her gradually into another kind of person. And that history has been written over and over again. And I have never heard anybody say this, but I think it's, I think it's the center of the truth about Elsa. The very fact that nobody ever raised the issue, I never heard anybody said, hey, what about if Elsa were station manager? Now, I'm not saying nobody ever said that, but I never heard it said. And uh, I have put this to one or two people s uh, since then uh, who were inside, and uh, their eyes lit up and said, hey, never thought of that. That's all I can report at this point, because this is, uh, uh, this, this is like a, 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 a revelation that I had while talking to Scott Keach couple of nights ago and I put it to him and he thought yeah yeah hey hey maybe that's uh, maybe there's a lot in that so I, th I think that at the very least uh, it, it is um, uh, it's a theorem of considerable weight I, I put it to Pat Scott, and, and of course her eyes shone uh, <laughs> when I said it. But uh, uh, if and I, I, uh, uh, I, I said to her, I said, if, if you, Pat, had been 20 years older and back there and in the station, I said, you'd be a witch. And she said, I am a witch. <laughs> the... Uh, I'm not sure who is going to read this book because I'm not sure who reads books at all anymore. Uh, there's uh, um, a, there is a contention that, that, the, uh, that the readers of, of, of books, particularly of historical books, are becoming older and older uh, relative to the demographics of, 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 of population. But uh, one thing that I do want to explore uh, is the possibility of uh, CD-ROM publication. And I've already talked to some people about this and had some, some healthy nibbles. Because uh, one of the things about a history of KPFA without any examples of the programming is sort of like a textbook on Renaissance art without any reproductions in it. Uh, one is forced into verbal approximations of sonic experiences, and uh, uh, right, you can you can get uh, you know terribly uh, you know versatile and and, and uh, um, expert at, at at describing things, but uh, you're just showing off your verbal pyrotechnics at that point. Uh, you're not uh, you're not presenting the real thing, and I would like to explore the possibility of putting together something which included um, a healthy selection of excerpts from KPFA programming over the years. Now, this is going to be tricky because styles change to the point where one can listen to something that was produced 30 years ago, 40 years ago, almost 50 years ago, and which at the time seemed terribly exciting uh, and, and now, sort of sounds like the equivalent of uh, of uh, you know, 
little stick figures going around on an old uh, on an old film at double speed, uh, and and uh, it it can sound dated, but uh, there's enough I'm sure that does not, and I think that the effort that the purpose of such a thing should not be to exhibit how funny KPFA used to sound. I don't think, God forbid, that one should be going after horrible examples of, uh, of the time they, uh, they dropped the tape on the floor and the announcer started. Uh, I, I think that what is, uh, uh, what is called for is the assemblage of programs, parts of programs from the past which still speak to the present, and I think there are a good many such things. And I think that those will present a truer picture of the station than a mere historical collection of, of uh, uh, ancient dusty documents. So the Salvation Army used to have a saying, come to scoff and stay to pray. Uh, I came over here with a certain rather specific historical viewpoint on KPF, what, what KPFA was and what it uh, uh, had become and what it was heading in the direction of. And uh, my orientation was um, traditional, uh, intellectual, uh, um, elitist, uh, because that was that was my upbringing, and I make uh, I make no apology for it in that way. I I, I think that I still think that elitism uh, is one of the many things which has something to contribute to society, along with a lot of other viewpoints, but. My attitude towards KPFA has always been determined, I will say, solely by my instinctive reactions to the people that I met in connection with the station and the people that I heard on the air. When I heard somebody, my response was immediately, is this somebody that I want to listen to? Is this somebody that I am going to take seriously because he has the sonic equivalent of body language that says that this person has a brain uh, and, uh, um, a, uh, and a sensibility and that uh, his opinions and everything which is script is opinion. It's, if, it's, uh, 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 if you're listening to actuality, that can be opinion as well, but at least you can, you can pretend that what you're listening to is what is actually happening. But as soon as somebody opens their mouth, immediately what you have is an opinion and a person saying something. Uh, and it, it is not objective fact. Anything that comes out of the mouth of a person is not objective fact. And uh, so my instinctive reaction to the station was always, are these people I want to listen to? And uh, the impression that I had been given by many people the thing that I most commonly heard was, I don't, I used to listen to KPFA, but I don't listen anymore. Uh, and this, you know, I heard over and over again with the implication that there were damn good reasons why they didn't listen anymore. But I felt in order to write something about the station, which even pretends to come up to the present time, I'm going to have to talk to people who are in there now running the thing and producing programs. And so with introductions from Eric Barsfeld, who still knows everybody there, uh, I, I went in, met people, made appointments, and started interviewing them. And uh, this may sound as if I'm attempting to curry favor with those in power at the moment, but the honest truth is that every person I talked to, I felt I immediately established a rapport with. And I felt as if I were talking to, for lack of a better word, a kindred spirit. Now, I might uh, very well, if I were engaged in a debate, I would probably have some violent disagreements with these people. But as human beings, eye to eye, I was talking to friends. I was talking to people I understood that, yes, this is KPFA. This is what I remember. And so those are the personal sort of, of intuitions on which I base my response. And I was turned around 180 degrees by that fact. When I came to Berkeley and uh, went to the house where I was staying, 
Of course, the first thing that I did was to turn on the radio with my host's permission, tune it to 94.1, and uh, listen to KPFA. I had about a half an hour to spare. I, uh, the first thing that I heard for somewhere between 10 and 15 minutes was some of the most embarrassing marathon fundraising that I had ever heard in my whole association with the station, and I've heard a lot of embarrassing fundraising in my time. And I sank lower and lower into my chair, thinking, oh my God, it's even worse than they told me. But I stuck with it. At the end of that 10 to 15 minutes, they then cut to a, uh, a news bulletin from the, uh, from the network uh, which had come from uh, uh, Mexico, Chiapas, I think, uh, a report on alternative politics in Mexico. Now, this is something I've been following, not with the eye and ear of a professional, but with some close attention in London and reports in The Guardian and uh, in, in such places. And I sat riveted for 15 minutes listening to the most cogent uh, encyclopedically presented uh, uh, summary of what was happening in, in, in Mexican alternative politics at the moment with very beautifully produced interviews in Spanish fading under simultaneous translation. And I thought, my God, this is what I've been waiting to hear about what is happening in Mexico. And I realized that at the end, KPFA, as always, the worst and the best. In those days, and I think in all days at KPFA, the relationship between the broadcaster and the listener was ambivalent. There was, uh, the listener, of course, was, well, was not only necessary, but, but was the purpose for which we existed. We weren't really there for the purpose of talking to each other, although sometimes it, it seemed like it. But the listener was the, was the reason that, 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 that we were broadcasting. At the same time, it was very difficult to deal with the kind of proprietary interest that, that, uh, that listeners sometimes expressed. And what exactly did you do to the person who walked in off the street uh, with a marvelous idea for producing an eight-part series on Scientology? Uh, it, it, was, uh, it was a continuous sort of thing. And in those days, it was not a question of minority group representation. Uh, the, the, there had not been the fragmentation of minority groups into special interest groups that has taken place since for all kinds of perfectly understandable reasons. But uh, at, at that time, it was uh, the most difficult thing that one had to deal with was sometimes uh, you know, nutters that, uh, that wanted to speak to an audience of one, namely themselves at great length. And uh, so there, there's one misunderstanding, and, and it is, it's a profound misunderstanding about what the station was at the very beginning. KPFA, at its start, was an unashamedly elitist broadcast of intellectuals to people who had something to learn from them, not necessarily fellow intellectuals, but people who were prepared to, to listen to them. And, uh, and, and Lou Hill writing after the fact in the, uh, in the late 50s uh, about the purpose of KPFA wrote something which was both a statement of purpose and a statement of history at that time because it was written eight years after going on uh, on the air uh, in which he uh, uh, in, in which he said that the purpose of KPFA I'm paraphrasing was to engage the best minds in the community uh, and to give them a means of uh, expressing what they had to say to the community at large who could benefit from uh, uh, from what they had to say and it was not 
in any sense. In fact, he made a point of the fact that this was not community access to the station, that it was the leaders of the community, the ones who ought by right to be the leaders of the community because of their, their intellect and their virtue. I mean, that word was not used, but that was what was meant. Uh, speaking to those who could learn from it. And I think that the history of KPFA uh, since that time and of public radio and television in general has been a story of the internecine warfare which has taken place among those who believed that that stand should be moved in the direction of community response and even total community control on the one hand, and those who believed that the stations should continue to be the voice of moral and intellectual authority, telling people what they ought to hear. And the whole history is a spectrum between those two extremes, and they fought it out with each other to the death. 